Hey folks, so now we are going to continue with talking about um, our different aspects related to touch perception. So we've spent some time talking about how touch sensation happens. Now we're going to talk about aspects related to touch perception. So we're going to start this by talking about tactile sensitivity as well as acuity. So early psychophysical research actually looked quite a bit at tactile sensitivity. Your book talks about the work of Max von Frey, who was best known today for what are known as von Frey hairs. So basically um, what you can do with von Frey hairs is, um, at least what Max von Frey did, is basically take horse hair and human hair of varying diameters and would press it against the skin to actually see if people could sense it. And um, today we still utilize Von Fry hairs, but we're a lot more likely to use a synthetic hair. And when you do these kind of tactile sensitivity studies, we do tend to find that our touch sensitivity varies across the body in line with what we find in the primary and secondary somatosensory cortices. Generally, we're gonna find that areas that we tend to use a lot to either communicate with other people or explore our world uh, tend to be more sensitive. So by and large, our face is incredibly sensitive. Um, to a lesser extent, our hands are sensitive. Um, so the face and the hands tend to be the most sensitive. The upper body is a little less sensitive and our lower extremities like our feet and our lower limbs uh, tend to be the least sensitive of all. And you might've experienced this when, uh, if you've ever potentially stubbed your toe. Now, when I get a paper cut on my hand, I feel it almost immediately as soon as it happens, even before uh, a cut shows up on my hand or before it starts to bleed. Um, but if I stub my toe, <laughs> That takes a little bit more time for me to notice. And whereas I can actually feel the paper cut against my skin and I can feel that localized pain, if you stub your toe, it tends to not feel as very sharp or as localized. You tend to feel that throbbing pain characteristic of that second pain that I mentioned. Now, there are some other ways that researchers have tried to examine tactile sensitivity besides uh, von Frey hairs. So other researchers have looked at the smallest raised element we can detect on a smooth surface, like a small little bump. And what we find is that we can actually detect a bump as small as 10 nanometers high. And this largely happens because that small bump actually triggers our FA1 receptors, our Meissner corpuscles. For vibration, which is pressure change over time, um, what we are gonna notice is that the thresholds for our different uh, mechanoreceptors um, depend on certain types of frequencies. So we're gonna use uh, different mechanoreceptors for different frequencies. So by and large, our um, SA1 receptors or our Merkel discs are gonna be really useful for lower frequency vibrations. And uh, as you can kind of see, um, they have their particular threshold for slightly higher frequencies. We're going to use those Meissner corpuscles. And then finally, when we get to these higher areas of vibration up to a point, we're going to get our FA2 receptors or our Pacinian corpuscles. Now, in addition to looking at things like what is the smallest diameter horse hair we can detect on different parts of the body, what is the smallest raised element that we can detect on a smooth surface, what is the um, smallest vibration that we can resolve, we can also ask about spatial differences in different touches. And so a pretty classic method that we do to look at spatial localization at different parts on the skin is what's known as two-point touch discrimination. Um, and this is actually pretty easy uh, to try at home. I would highly encourage that you do this. Uh, if you have a metal compass, 
uh, like the kind that you might use in your geometry classes. That can work pretty well. This also works pretty well with two different pencils or um, two different pens. And so basically what you do is you take those two points, you put those two points very, very close together on the skin um, on a particular body part. So maybe you try this on the thumb or maybe you try this on the wrist. And so the idea is that you ask yourself, can you feel a single point or can you feel the two separate points that are being made by these pencils or these pens or the compass? If you only feel a single point, separate the two pens or the two pencils or the compass and keep increasing that distance until you can consistently feel two separate points. Um, and just like we see with our sensitivity to tactile pressure, uh, two-point touch discrimination sensitivity varies widely across the body. And just as we found that areas of the body that are more sensitive are, um, they can detect smaller differences in pressure, like we saw with the von Frey hairs, um, areas that have smaller receptive fields are also going to be more sensitive and they will require a smaller distance in two-point touch. So if we look at areas in the face or the fingers, for example, a fingertip requires um, a smaller distance between points to actually detect those two separate points. So as an example, you can see the different receptive fields of the different mechanoreceptors, and each of these points occupies a different receptive field, so that means that we will detect two separate points. In contrast, that same distance on the, on the wrist does not occupy two different receptive fields. It occupies the same receptive field, and thus you will only feel a single point. We tend to find that areas that have smaller receptive fields and are more sensitive in two-point touch discrimination, again, tend to be the face and the hands. So you're going to see that your distance for two-point touch discrimination is going to be pretty low for something like the tongue or the face or the tip of your finger, and it's going to be larger for things like your thigh or your trunk or your foot. Now, what about time-based differences with respect to touch? So with two-point touch discrimination, we are delivering two touches simultaneously in slightly different locations. With temporal differences in touch, we're going to deliver two pulses um, to the same area of skin in quick succession. And will we be able to feel those two separate pulses? Can we make a temporal distinction between them? And how much does that temporal difference have to be for us to notice those two pulses? It turns out that we're pretty sensitive to time-based differences in touch. We're actually sensitive to temporal differences of five milliseconds. So it's if it's five milliseconds or larger, we can detect the differences in touch. We can tell that those are two separate touches. Now, what's kind of interesting is that when we try this with vision, you have to have a temporal difference of at least 25 milliseconds. If you try this with hearing, you only need a temporal difference of 0.01 milliseconds. So what this means is that with respect to time-based differences in touch, touch is better than vision, but it's not as good as hearing. Are there individual differences in touch sensitivity? Now, some senses, as we've kind of talked about, like hearing and vision, can decline with age. But this is a case where your experience affects whether or not this declines for you. So we do tend to find, for example, that if you are sighted, we do tend to find that your sensitivity in touch does decline with age. So what you're looking at here are age in years of sighted and blind people identifying uh, Braille. And so here we have uh, in our um, x-axis, we have tactile activity in log units. Here we have the tactile activity in terms of millimeters. And what's really interesting is that 
The uh, tactile activity declines with age in sighted people. Now, what's really kind of critical is that around... Um, this is going to have important implications because um, your standard Braille is located here in the log zero transform or um, the log transform. Um, and it basically corresponds to about 2.28 millimeters. And you'll notice that for sighted older adults, um, that decline basically crosses right around 74 or 75 years of age. Now, what's really interesting is that if you are blind, you don't see an age-related decline. And that's largely because you have to rely on touch in a way that you do not necessarily have to do if you are sighted. So as I kind of mentioned in this figure, um, this does have some pretty important implications if sight is lost in older age. Um, so for example, my grandfather has actually lost a good bit of his sight due to macular degeneration, which we talked about um, earlier in the semester, where you basically have that scotoma in your central most vision. If you lose your sight, after the age of 74, your visual abilities are basically not going to be able to help you with Braille. If they happen prior to 74, there is a small window of opportunity to learn Braille and have that, um, have that tactile sensitivity that you otherwise would not have. So this is a case where your prior experiences can really play a role in age-related decline. So we're going to finish up by talking about haptic perception. So what do I mean by haptic perception? So when we talk about tactile sensitivity, we're looking at very, very simple differences in time for different types of touches, um, in location for different types of touches, the smallest units that we can see. But haptic perception is largely derived from not only the receptors in the skin, like tactile sensitivity, but also the muscles, the joints, and the tendons, part of that kinesthetic sense. And haptic perception is really different from tactile sensitivity because it implies an active sense. We need to interact with objects to actually learn more about them. Um, and this is what is referred to as action for perception. And so uh, one of the things that you're going to see with action for perception, for example, is that there are a different variety of what are known as exploratory procedures for learning about objects. So if you touch something with kind of a lateral motion and move your hand across a surface, you can learn something about texture. Uh, if you provide a little bit of pressure, like I sometimes do with my soaps um, or with my shampoo, poo bars, I am learning something about its hardness. If I do static contact, I put my hand on it and I touch it, um, we're getting temperature. If we do unsupported holding, we are trying to figure out the weight. If we do enclosure, as you can kind of see with this hand holding the cup, we're getting a better idea at the global shape and the volume. If we follow the edges of a contour, we're following its global shape and we're trying to get information on it, its exact shape. And so these exploratory procedures were largely um, discussed by Roberta Klatsky, one of your textbook authors. In addition to acting to learn more about the properties of material objects, we can also engage in what is known as perception for action. We can use our senses to help grasp and manipulate objects. So we can use different actions to help perceive objects, or we can use our perception of those objects to act upon them. Now, what's kind of interesting about the haptic sense, and it hasn't been studied as much as vision and hearing, but we're learning more about haptic uh, perception all the time. And it turns out that like the visual system, we do actually have haptic what and where pathways. So we can use touch to help us identify and recognize objects. Um, now, when it comes to object recognition with respect to touch, we are far more interested in the material properties of an object, um, how rough it is, how what the texture of it is, how soft is it, 
How hard is it? And that's really critical for recognizing something by its touch. Now, that's really different from visual recognition which is far more often based on the geometric properties of objects, such as shape or size. And researchers have actually um, examined whether or not people actually can use geometric properties to do touch recognition. Generally, we find that they really don't. They tend to look at the material properties of these objects instead. Now, one of the other things that we tend to find that is pretty interesting is that we can use this what recognition to basically engage in perceptual pop-out like we do with visual search. So just as a reminder of how visual search works, um, I present you with a target object in a bunch of different distractors. So let's say, for example, that we're looking for a red X in an array of blue O's. Now, because this is a feature-based search, that red X is going to pop out no matter how many distractors we have. Now, that's how it works in vision. How might this work with haptic perception? So this is actually a pretty cool, uh, ingenious little device here. There are different textures that are being presented on these wheels. They're either smooth or they're rough. And these can basically be presented to up to six fingers, three on each hand. And so uh, the researchers that utilize this procedure uh, basically would look and see if people could detect rough stimuli surrounded by a bunch of smooth stimuli. And they basically looked at this haptic search. So what you're looking at on your x-axis is the number of fingers uh, stimulated as well as the response time. So here's what we're kind of looking at when the target is present. It doesn't matter how many fingers are stimulated. We do get a perceptual pop out, that line is pretty flat. Um, in contrast, if the target is absent, we see a slightly more exhaustive search. Um, so we do get that phenomenon of perceptual pop out, but it's a bit more complex. You can see a similar procedure um, with different objects being placed in a hand and trying to figure out things like uh, different weights, uh, different textures, um, different temperatures and so on. And what we tend to find is that this pop out will generally happen if we have contrasts such as trying to search for a rough object in a bunch of smooth objects, trying to find a hard object in a bunch of small or soft objects, trying to find a cool object in uh, in a bunch of warm objects. Now, the perceptual pop-out and the haptic search does not look exactly like visual search, but this is actually pretty interesting and it does help us understand that perceptual pop-out can happen. Now, one of the other pieces of evidence that we have for there being a what pathway and that touch is really critical for object recognition occurs with patients that have what are known as uh, tactile agnosia. This is an inability to actually recognize objects by touch. This will usually be due to damage in parts of the parietal lobe that are really critical for somatosensation. So back in 1994, Reed and Caselli reported a patient with tactile agnosia in the right hand, but not the left. And this was largely due to left parietal lobe damage. Remember that for our sense of touch, the left side of the brain basically is responsible for the right side of the body. So if we have damage to the left parietal lobe, that is going to cause uh, tactile issues in the right side of the body. So this patient had trouble um, identifying objects if she had to um, explore using the right hand, um, but this did not happen with the left. The patient could actually use the left hand and visual senses to aid recognition, just as people with visual agnosia can use other types of senses to basically re help uh, recognize an object when vision is not possible. Now, in contrast to our what pathway, uh, the where pathway of touch is responsible for locating objects, such as trying to figure out where an object is located using only touch to do so. So this would be like in the morning if your alarm clock goes off and basically 
um, your eyes aren't quite open yet and you're trying to figure out how to shut it off just by using your sense of touch. Now, like our visual and auditory systems, when we're trying to locate things in the environment, we have a frame of reference. And typically this frame of reference will be represented as what is called an ego center. Basically, where everything is in the external environment in relation to you. That's why we call it an ego center. Now for vision, um, our ego center is pretty static. It's directly between our eyes, um, right between our two eyes with those two visual fields. With our hearing, we saw that our ego center is basically the azimuth. Um, it occurs between the ears directly in the center of the head. So it kind of follows, where is the ego center for touch? And we'll talk about this more next time.